Well, hello, beautiful artists, artisans on YouTube. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope your 2024 is coming in beautifully. I've got my coffee just in case I need it. God forbid if I lose my voice. In the last video, we uh, made little mug rugs that were um, inspired by the bor Boro building method. So we were using squares or rectangles and going along as in rows as we filled our spaces, envisioning that that next space maybe is a place that needs to be mended. I love, love the humbleness of using scraps. I love the humbleness of using Boro inspired methods, Kawandi inspired methods, because I'm totally in love with the history. Um, I want to share some history with you of, in a very general sense, just on the surface of quilts. And it will bring us to the little quilting method that we're using today, which is mostly a Western method, at least it's labeled as such, but is it really Western? So anyway, here we go. And then we're, and then we're going to make one of these together and I'm going to show you, we will begin the sashiko stitching. This one is machine stitched. And I'm going to point out the differences between this one and our Boro inspired and our Kawandi. So um, here we go. Quilting began, or at least they have evidence of a beginning back in 3400 BCE. 3,400, they have origins of it in a cave. And the, the word quilt um, comes from the Latin word um, culcita, C-U-L-C-I-T-A. So I got this information from um, Britannica and um, Wikipedia and a little bit from this beautiful book that I love that I was telling you about in the last uh, video, which I can't share because I can't show any of the images. However, I did find out that if an image was taken before 1927, I can share it. So I just need to do a little bit more research and investigation on that before I pull any images from this book. But the book is called Old Swedish Quilts, and it is by far the most detailed, the most beautiful book I have ever found on quilts. And um, so anyway, the first quilt uh, in England dates back to the 13th century. And uh, the first quilts in Europe, in general, date back to the 12th century, where they were uh, found as clothing, quilted clothing, being used under the armor of soldiers and whatnot uh, to, to keep them warm and for, it to, for the armor to have a soft cushion, to have a cushion to sit on so that armor wasn't against their body. So that's super interesting, right? So you 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 know that the, the quilting in these dates way back were used more out of necessity. It was created more out of necessity, just like in the Japanese, uh, the Japanese farmers uh, doing their boro. Um, and, and actually that's quilted, boro inspired quilts. Um, had cushions uh, in their 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 blankets and um, other items that they created to stay warm. Uh, in Sweden, there's a quilt that dates back into the 1500s, and this just I when I read this information, this particular quilt, I was so overjoyed I can't even tell you because and I'm going to share with you why. There was a quilt made of silk with fabric lining or what I call the base. And this quilt belonged to King Gustav, who I believe was a Swedish king. It was found in his estate in the 1500s. Now I created, the reason why this just made me so happy is because 
I'm happy to create something original. Don't get me wrong. But when I created this uh, quilt, uh, inspired by Boro Method, I created this quilt, and you've seen this before. This has been on my channel. I think I have it upside down right now. But this quilt is all silky fabrics. Some of them are pure silk. They are uh, silk sarongs, silk scarves. Um, some of them may be rayon, but they're all recycled fabrics. And I made it against cotton fabric. And when, when and I did, and I hand stitched it, and I love it. This has been in a few exhibits, and I hesitated to make more of these because I and I know better because I'm so non traditional. However, I do know that lightweight or silky fabrics, you know, you need to be careful with them. You can't take them and just throw them right, um, or use them like a sleeping bag. So a piece like this would be a wall hanging or it would be a special heirloom piece. But because it was made of all silk, all silky fabrics, I've hesitated to make another one. But guess what? Since I read this, that this isn't the first time this type of, of quilt was made. Um, quilting. Uh, these silk fabrics were used and leather was used, mind you, in this time era in Sweden also. And what they call broad cloth is very wide type of cotton, op like a, a not, I don't know if it's a loose weave, but it's, it's a cotton weave. It's woven cotton. <laughs> so, um, and then in, next in the timeline, and we're not even covering all the countries, um, we're not covering all countries because look, this here, this one, the Kawandi that we did, the Kawandi method with Sashiko hand stitching where we're going all the way around and this is quilted. This goes back, this method has been found to go back thousands of years. Okay. This is, this goes way back. And this was used um, originally, these were pieces that were made to be heirlooms of blankets for families. They represented a family or they were given as a gift to a family member. So how beautiful is that? Um, and then we have, uh, this is the, the another Boro um Boro building, and I was playing around with different shapes here a little bit, um, and that's all hand done also, and that's a back to front hem. And I'm just showing you these a little bit because the progression of um, Sashiko stitching, Sashiko stitching um, falls in line with what they call Wabi Sabi, which is the concept that you can find beauty in something broken and the humbleness of sashiko stitching the fact that it's not perfect is what makes it so beautiful um i i tried in this this um piece i focused and wanted a perfect circle okay i wanted a circle i made one circle I think in a pencil, and then I just followed as I went around. I do most of uh, everything in free hand, so I have to really stop and make myself outline something, which is smart to do. It's a good thing to do as you're uh, developing your skill. So, uh, but this this was the progression was uh, cre going from creating things of necessity to creating things more for a decorative manner. So now we get to the United States, right? Um, in the 17th and 18th century, you're finding quilting uh, being done, right, with the middle piece, you know, really cushiony, maybe a couple of these. These are from the thrift shop. Really cushion, cushioning 
their quilts because they want to make hearts, they want to make designs on the top layer, and they really want their quilting to be decorative. So around this time in the 1800s, the quilters, the uh, ladies started taking their scraps and because fabric was not easy to, it was not highly accessible. Let's put it that way. Today, we have billions. I'm not saying millions. I'm saying B with a B. Billions of pounds of fabric in the landfills. That's, you know, for lack of a better word, it's crazy, right? Now, I'm showing you the crazy quilt. It's not called the crazy quilt because of what I just said. It's called the crazy quilt because... These pieces, when you put these together, it's you're not you're not working with, you know, a square overlapping another square. You're working with obscure, obtuse angles, and uh, really, you know, and it so it looks different. So you can see there's a real big difference in it. And um, I made this one small because I wanted to uh, work with you today, making um, another one with you, um, just laying out the design and then just starting to stitch or talking to you about how you can uh, put this together. So with that, what we will do is, um, I'm gonna take one sip of this. We'll put the camera down and we will lay out a design of the crazy quilt. So the crazy quilt has been around since the 1800s. And um, I first heard about the crazy quilt oh, at half a century ago, so really long time ago. And um, I thought it was called the crazy quilt because it looks crazy. And it, it kind of was because it was just all different directions that the fabrics we're going now and that includes your stitches now you see I went around the border a couple of times and in the middle I did some stipple stitching going in all different directions that is um, intricate that's a um, you that's part of the crazy quilt is using the stipple stitching I could have gone with squares but how ridiculous would that be when I have forms going all different ways. So if you're gonna stipple stitch and make sure that they are stitched to the fabric, you're gonna go uh, you're gonna go according to the, the curves and the angles and all of that to make sure that this is going to be a well stitched uh, quilt or mat or whatever it is you're making. So excuse me, with that we're going to put the video down the camera down and we're going to lay out one of these quilts and I want to show you just how ridiculous these angles are and why that's called the crazy quilt so this is scrap fabric now it's not talking about necessarily a scrap fabric that's straight on all sides it's talking about these type of fabrics that are not straight. So you've got one like this. And you have to go along that with this, make sense of it or make designs of it with it. And that's the craziness that comes into play here because you're you're not throwing away these scraps. You're saving them and you're making a beautiful blanket. You're making a beautiful quilt and you're trying to figure out how to design these. Now you can just keep going along like this and just overlap them. But I think what I'm going to do is play with them a little bit, like they're a little puzzle. And with that, maybe if I have a piece that's really long like that, I can cut it. But I'm looking really more for these pieces that are like this. 
You're seeing the curves. There's a heart there. Look at this one. This isn't even a design. That's part, part of the um, fabric. It's a good piece of fabric, so I'm going to put it there. But it's the end part of a fabric. Now, the other reason it's called Crazy Quilts is you may get different types of fabrics. But you're definitely going to get different um, designs. This one I'm going to cut. But this is almost like creating um, something with zero waste. You know, like instead of throwing this in the garbage, you're taking these pieces and you, you're taking a seam even. Put the seam right on there. Um... Look at this piece. This is not a piece I would normally use. But with this method, I am. Now, I'm having a little hard time with this one because I'm realizing now, look, that was a heart I had cut out. That's some good fabric right there. Maybe I used the heart to, to overlap a little bit, make, make it a little thicker. That's okay. Now, as we go along, um, we're going to get different um, shapes that may be really difficult to do something with. What I say with that is if you want to use it, put it, put it, just, you don't have to have a perfect place for it. Just, you can overlap it. You can, and if you can't overlap it, just set it right on another piece of fabric. And um, now where you start to, this is a Western. They are uh, crediting the West with this. Now, and they, they categorize this really in the uh, area of patchwork. And you'll hear that word a lot. You'll hear it with Boro. Um, you'll hear it with, um, the, the, uh, e even the Kawandi, you, you'll hear it. You'll hear it with the Western, um, quilts. You'll hear it actually all around the world. And, um, it's just another way to describe that you're taking different patches, different pieces of material and, um, creating with it. It doesn't mean um, that it's not, that that doesn't fall in its own category because you have your crazy quilt. So look at this. This is adorable. It, it actually took a little bit more concentration for me to um, really piece that together. I'm like, but I love it. Now, the next thing I'm doing with this and look, you notice the pieces do not have to be straight up and down. And we tend to put them up and down. We tend to want to make them straight. But this piece, it could be, it could be like that. You know, it doesn't have to be straight. Now you'll see that method also in Boro. You you can put things on an angle. That's perfectly acceptable. Now the next thing I'm going to do is start pinning everything down. So I can start to sew. And I don't have things move too far out of place. Now what I would do as I go along is just make sure, um, because these pieces do move, you're gonna see that because you've got a lot of pieces there. The other way you could do this is just simply sew it as you go. Sew your crazy piece on, sew it and then pick another piece out of the pile that's wonderfully therapeutic that is actually a kawandi method 
working from the soul, pulling the pieces, just going with the piece that feels right to you and working with that. Um, this one I'm going to trim just a little, just so I can work a little bit better. Usually we sew and then trim. So I'm going to get you started on this. What you typically do is start on underside of your first layer. Now you can use what they call freestyle sashiko stitching. That is a little difficult for me to do because it is so freestyle. It doesn't go in a straight line. It goes all over the place. It's actually a little difficult to do. Now, I'm going to attempt it because I just mentioned it. So, I'm going to go this. I'm going to start over here first. And maybe I will make an, an X here. So now with freestyle Sashiko stitching, I'm going in different directions. And it kind of goes nicely with this because this little mat, mug rug, this little piece is going in different directions. I see we just lost that. We can put that back on after. And, you know, maybe this gives us an opportunity to not do the, we're not doing the continuous running stitch. So maybe we can, <clears throat> excuse me, focus on kind of getting more towards the center of this piece to get the bulk of these um, sewed on. And this just slipped off its uh, needle. So we're gonna put that one back on, but not to waste a lot of time with you on this. I think that you can see the direction we're going and how we put all this together. So um, I'll do a few more stitches and we'll get this one back on there because um, that will be good if we can go around our perimeter, go around the center a little bit, kind of uh, get these stitches a little sporadic. And then if you wanted to with um, Sashiko Free stitching, you can also um, add a different type of stitch. You can do the French knot or you can do a little section which is which I love the best a little section of running stitches they may go all horizontal and then some go physical of uh, for of uh, vertical physical they may go horizontal and then go uh vertical so um okay there we go so this is the idea. We're gonna go in as many different directions as we can with our freestyle Sashiko stitching. We're going to switch the methods of Sashiko stitching. Now, this is me mixing and borrowing methods and techniques from Boro, but this is a Western way of creating a quilt, crazy quilt. And it's easy. You can do it by hand. You can uh, do it with a sewing machine, um, you know, and then after you sew everything on here, you go and trim your back. And then you can add, if you want, you can add, unless you're making a wall piece, but you can add your quilt and you can do um, a back to front quilting or you can do what they call back to back quilting, which is this, which is my favorite quilt in the world. Um, but this is back to back quilting. This has all different, you can see 
Um, here I used um, some V's and then I used some running stitches. This is a seam right here. This is Sashiko Free stitching the entire quilt. Um, I would not call it a crazy quilt because these pieces are more um, manipulated. I did not cut them in perfect squares. I used all scraps, but um, I did not use scraps from a scrap pile specifically like this to create zero tolerance. So anyway, with that, um, I hope that gives you some ideas. I hope that um, if you need me to do uh, more of these, let me know. Uh, if you need more explanation or you have questions, someone asked me about ironing. I think I talked about it in the last video. That's a That was a great question and something I wouldn't even think of. I think what happens is working with scrap fabrics, so many of these fabrics today are non-iron, but um, that you don't think of it. However, uh, a piece like this, actually these are ironed because I ironed them after, uh, but I, I usually don't, if I iron, um, it's, I would say it's because I need to iron the fabric. Like when I make my jean hats, um, the jean seams are turned up a lot. I actually iron those quite a while. It takes me a while. I just don't put it on the video. But um, I think that was a great question. So any other questions you have or suggestions, please let me know. I, if you love the history tidbits, let me know because I love reading about them and learning and I love to share. So um, I plan to share those all through 2024 with you and um, just doing a little bit of uh, history tidbits and um, because it is so interesting to find out the origins of these methods and techniques and the hi the history and the culture that goes with them is phenomenal. So um, with that, uh, I will see you in the next one and you have a beautiful day.